Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching how Ukraine won the first phase of the war by kings and generals, the first episode in their series on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, before we get into this, a quick disclaimer. I'm a little sick right now, so if my voice sounds off, that's why. I apologize if I have to cough or clear my throat. I'll try to mute my microphone if that happens. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Now, I try to be respectful uh, whenever I'm covering any type of history, but with this topic in particular, I think it's worth all of us keeping in mind that this is an actively ongoing conflict. People are currently fighting and dying uh, as we watch this video, so everybody please keep it respectful in the comments. Uh, that also adds sort of another element to this series, you know, most of the videos we watch are about events long in the past, but this one is ongoing. I mean, I remember where I was when I heard that the war had began. You know, I can track my own personal experiences through the length of this war. It started earlier this year, and it's still going. So it's definitely interesting to be covering this series, which is sort of more current events than history, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to get into this one. Before we do, I'd very much appreciate it if you guys would check out my Patreon or become a channel member for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump into this reaction. All right. We like to be precise with our content and not cash in on the ongoing conflicts. So instead of spamming your timelines with hot takes constantly, we decided to take our time and summarize the continuing Russian invasion of Ukraine with monthly videos. The yep, and they have continued to do that since. Uh, that's one of the reasons I waited so long to do this reaction series, is that I didn't want to do these reactions immediately after the war began. I thought I would give it some time. And honestly, back when the war began, you know, we didn't even know it would go on for this long, so there was a thought that maybe I could react to this whole business once it was over, um, but of course it's dragged on to the end of 2022, and it doesn't seem to be coming to an end anytime soon. This conflict will enter history as pivotal, both historically and in terms of military science, so we'll have more to say over the next while. That is very true. I don't want to talk too much right here because <laughs> we have a lot to say about that throughout this entire series but yes this is a monumental war uh, a major war on the european continent in the year of 2022 that on its own is extremely important not to mention that the tactics the weapons uh the supplies how this war is being conducted you know it's all extremely instrumental in the future and the present of warfare but We'll have a lot to say about that as we watch these videos. For now, allow us to present you our video on the first phase of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And with a look at the war's beginning, we can also recommend a celebration of a war coming to an end, brought to you by our sponsor Magellan TV. Mm. All right, so you guys know the deal. This is their uh, sponsorship. Please go and check out this video by Kings and Generals. It's in the description down below. Check out their sponsor, leave them a like, show them support for making these fantastic videos. For only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing wow. to Magellan TV via our link in the description. There you go, use their link. In October 2021, the Russian army started a build-up on the Russia-Ukraine and Belarus-Ukraine borders. Mm -hmm. The Kremlin explained it with planned military exercises brushing aside all concerns, and declaring that they had a right to move their forces wherever they deemed necessary within their borders. But soon the United States started asserting that the massing of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border was a build-up for an impending invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of you guys remember watching the news at the time and seeing this build-up. Now, before the war actually started, there was a lot of chatter about, well, would this war actually happen? And I think most people didn't think it would happen. Um, some people were doubtful of what they were hearing from the U.S. government. Um, and a lot of people just thought it was unrealistic that such a momentous war would actually take place. I mean, before Russia invaded, 
it did seem pretty unrealistic that they would actually do it. I mean, it was a crazy, crazy thing to imagine. I will say I was one of the people who was, I think, a little more cautious than most um, in that I thought there was a definite possibility this war could happen when a lot of people I talked to thought, nah, there's just no chance. I was thinking, I don't know, <laughs> especially as we were getting into 2022 and Russia was amassing more and more material and troops on the border. Myself and some other people, though we still thought a war happening would be crazy, we're starting to think, you know what? <laughs> this looks like it could really, I mean, it looks like Russia is really gearing up for a war here. And that, of course, that's what actually happened. But, of course, you couldn't blame anybody for not knowing. Uh, it's an absolutely insane move from Russia. Um, and it was surprising to a lot of people. The Russian government vehemently denied this, while some NATO states and Ukraine considers the US reports exaggerated. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, that's what I was saying. A lot of people regarded the U.S.'s reports as exaggerated, and a lot of nations, including Ukraine, I mean, before the invasion, the Ukrainian government was also, you know, urging people to relax a little bit. They thought these reports were exaggerated. Uh, turns out they weren't. Nevertheless, by December, Russia started making demands for NATO to guarantee that Ukraine would never join the organization that yeah. the alliance would withdraw its forces from countries that joined the alliance after 1997, that NATO would stop its expansion, that NATO would seek agreement with Russia for any activities in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia. And of course, this is where we get into the history of the situation a little bit, because history is incredibly important. I mean, to all uh, modern politics and all modern conflicts, but to this one in particular, history plays an important role. You know, NATO was a direct competitor with Russia's Warsaw Pact back when they were the Soviet Union. When the USSR collapsed in 1991, you know, the Warsaw Pact went along with it. Russia lost a lot of its power, its sphere of influence. And, you know, following the collapse of the USSR, NATO continued to expand. As you can see, a lot of those former communist countries joined up with NATO. Now, Russia really doesn't like that, and for a while now, they've been trying to stop it. Uh, the 2008 invasion of Georgia, or the 2014 invasion of Crimea, these are both attempts to re-establish Russia's sphere of control and limit the expansion of NATO. Uh, and, you know, part of this recent war in Ukraine is because of that. Naturally, the United States and its allies rejected these proposals. Despite the Russian assurances and attempts of Western leaders like French President Emmanuel Macron to find cool. common ground. Yeah, well, when Angela Merkel was still in power, she was sort of the main European leader. But ever since she has left power, uh, Emmanuel Macron in France have sort of tried to fill that role. Macron has very much tried to be an international diplomat, inserting himself into a variety of crises uh, and trying to, you know, broker diplomacy. Uh, in this case, of course, <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, I don't think any diplomacy was going to work unless uh, the Western powers decided to give in to Russia's demands, but he made an attempt, as he always does. The tensions continued growing. On the 17th of February, forces of the unrecognized Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics and Ukraine accused each other of shelling. Unrecognized governments of Donetsk and Luhansk ordered the evacuation of their populations. Yeah, and it's worth noting that ever since that 2014 invasion of Crimea, of course, Russia has held Crimea, and there has been sort of low to mid-scale fighting in eastern Ukraine between uh, separatist Russian soldiers and, on the other side, Ukrainian armed forces. So there has basically been a low-scale war going on within Ukraine's territory since 2014, but, of course, this Russian invasion was a whole other scale. On the 21st of February 2022, the Russian President Vladimir Putin made a threatening speech, questioning Ukrainian statehood and calling it a Bolshevik-created entity. Yeah. On the same day... I remember this. This was a quite alarming speech to hear in real time. He was basically calling the legitimacy of the Ukrainian state into question. And I think what I have to say to that is that 
one, Putin misrepresents history a lot. There has been an independent Ukrainian identity for a long time, but, you know, a lot of states are artificial creations or just borders drawn on a map. That's what nation states are. That does not mean that a nation state doesn't have an independent identity with their own traditions and culture. Uh, and if you talk to Ukrainians, <laughs> they will very much tell you that they have their own traditions and culture separate from Russia. And even though there were uh, a lot of Russian-speaking Ukrainians uh, in eastern Ukraine, if you talk to them now, after this invasion, a lot of those who were previously more favorable to Russia have now completely left that behind because they've seen the destruction Russia has brought to their country, uh, and now they're all feeling very Ukrainian. So, of course, there was cultural similarity and cultural closeness between Russia and Ukraine, but by doing this invasion, all Russia has done, or I should say, all the Russian government has done, has wrenched Ukraine and Russia even further apart. Now the people of Ukraine really want nothing to do with Russia, when beforehand, a minority of them were pro-Russian. Of course, the majority of Ukrainians were more pro-Western, but now, you know, even that minority of pro-Russians uh, has mostly moved away from that. Russia became the first country to recognize the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, justifying this step by claiming that a genocide had been committed by the Ukrainian government and neo-Nazi groups against Russian-speaking people in Donbass. Yeah, this was Russia's big claim, and there's precedent for this. You know, if you look at Russia's invasion of Georgia or Crimea, or if we look far back in the past, uh, say the 1700s, 1800s uh, when Russia did a lot of invasions of the Ottoman Balkans, what they would always say was that the Ottomans were committing abuses against the Orthodox Christians. And since Russia was a protector of Orthodox Christians, they had to get involved and intervene. So this is a very familiar Russian trick. Russia always claims that a different country is abusing either ethnic Russians or Russian allies or Orthodox Christians, and then gets involved militarily. Now, you know, on the validity of those claims, of course there are some neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine, but it's just patently false to say that they were running the government or they were running things. Not true. On an anti-Russian genocide, it was just ridiculous. There was some uh, anti-Russian language policy in eastern Ukraine, that's true, but just no such thing was happening. So Putin's claims were entirely false, as the claims of the Russian Empire of, you know, protecting minorities have been many times before. Despite that, he used them as a pretense to invade. In the early morning of the 24th of February, Putin announced the start of the special military operation to denazify and <laughs> demilitarize Ukraine. A military conflict in Ukraine, which started in 2014, turned into a full-scale war with Russia's invasion. Yeah, the whole denazify thing is, is kind of a big thing for Russia because if you think back to World War II, you know, the Soviets were a major factor in defeating the Nazis. Um, so that's still big in the Russian memory, though it is very ironic because, of course, Russia's government is a, you know, far-right government of its own. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty ironic that they're going into Ukraine to denazify when the Russian government is more far-right than the Ukrainian government is. According to different estimates, Russia deployed 150,000 to 200,000 troops out of total active personnel of approximately 900,000, hmm. along with up to 40,000 separatists from Donetsk and Luhansk, later joined by a few thousand troops from Syria and separatist republics of Abkhazia and Ossetia. Abkhazia, South Ossetia, those are... Uh, the regions that Russia has claimed in Georgia. It is safe to assume that most of the best Russian troops were deployed to Ukraine. At the same time, the rest of the active personnel were mostly conscripts stationed throughout vast Russia. The Russian army divides into Battalion Tactical Groups, BTG, which are autonomous military units consisting of infantry, armoured and unarmoured military vehicles, artillery, field hospitals and so on. Mm. According to the latest pre-invasion figures provided by the official U.S. sources, 
Russia amassed approximately 120 BTGs on the border with Ukraine. And by the way, what I will say about all of this information and these numbers is that take them with a grain of salt because they're making this video, you know, shortly after the invasion happened. It's now months after the invasion has happened. So we might have more up-to-date, accurate information. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at all of this. BTGs usually have 600 to 1,000 infantrymen and are supposed to have 10 tanks and between 40 and 70 other armored vehicles. This allows us to estimate that 1,200 tanks and 4,800 to 8,400 other armored vehicles are being used in the Russian Expeditionary Force if all BTGs are equipped by the book, which is rarely the case. Well, yeah, and especially as the war has dragged on, we have seen Russia has a serious shortage of, well, basically everything it needs, weapons, armor, uh, armored vehicles. Uh, they've been having to use some <laughs> very old armored vehicles and very old weapons. So whatever level they were equipped at at the beginning of the war, it's only gotten worse for them. Especially in an army known for vast corruption and poor administration. Mm. According to the ISS military balance, Russia possesses 1,391 military aircraft and 544 attack helicopters, but it is impossible to know how many of them Russia is exactly using in the war in Ukraine. The same source shows that Ukraine has active personnel of approximately 200,000 troops, more than 3,000 armored vehicles, 132 military aircraft, and 55 helicopters. Yeah, now look at these numbers. <laughs> of course, Ukraine is a much smaller country than Russia. And if you look at this comparison, I mean, and this is just counting Russian troops and tanks on the border, right? Russia is vastly larger with vastly more resources than Ukraine. So when this war began, you know, there was, for a lot of people, a sense of hopelessness. How on earth could Ukraine resist this Russian onslaught? And for a while, you know, Russia kept pushing and pushing and pushing. It was getting worse and worse. Now, amazingly, Ukraine has managed to defend themselves and push back. But at the beginning, it, it seemed like that might not happen because they were so vastly outnumbered. Now, part of that has been the supplies Ukraine has got from the West and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't want to talk about that too much now. We'll get to that down the line. But at the beginning, you know, it seemed like Russia had a major upper hand. Since Ukraine has declared general mobilization and armed volunteer territorial defense, we could assume the actual number of people resisting the invasion is way higher. Moreover, thousands of volunteers joined Ukraine's international brigade. While talking about the comparison of forces, it is necessary to note that the Ukrainian army has come a long way since 2014. Mm, yeah. The army has been significantly modernized. Its military... This is true. I mean, there's been a lot of effort put into Ukraine's military, which makes a lot of sense since they were invaded by Russia in 2014 and lost Crimea. And then, you know, of course, Ukraine wasn't a member of NATO, but it did get a lot of assistance in training from fellow NATO countries, particularly the United States. Military arsenal is much better, as the United States, United Kingdom, Turkey, and others have right. provided Ukraine with anti-tank weapons like Enlor and Javelin, mm -hmm. anti-aircraft... And these are going to be very important throughout the war, but we're going to talk more about them later, I'm sure. ...missile systems such as Stinger, along with TB-2 by Rektar drones. Yep. The Russian offensive started with a massive shelling and airstrike campaign throughout Ukraine, with more than 100 missile strikes to destroy the Ukrainian military infrastructure, bases, anti-aircraft missile systems, and arms depots. Yeah, and you know, you guys can write and tell me about your experience. I just remember watching this play out live was very odd, right? Because it was basically like I'm watching this war unfold like over social media, right? And the news, I'm looking on Twitter on different news sites and seeing all this stuff happening as I sit thousands of miles away in my you know, comfortable uh, home, you know, living well in the United States, you know, safe as ever. Um, and it was very odd sort of dissonance, right? Just sitting thousands of miles away and watching this all play out in real time. I just remember it was a really strange 
uh, experience uh, just to see all of this. The later events demonstrated that Russia failed to achieve its goal, as the Ukrainian military infrastructure, albeit heavily damaged, managed to mostly stay intact. This True, but at the time, <laughs> it was just Russia bombing all across Ukraine, and it seemed far more bad than I think it ended up being. Like, like I said, it really, to some extent, seemed a little hopeless at the beginning because it was just this overwhelming bombing campaign. Um, and so in retrospect, you know, Ukraine has managed to defend itself. But when all this bombing started and Russia was pushing from every angle, it seemed like it might be over already. This was followed. And I mean, that's what Russia was going for. They were going for basically this blitzkrieg style attack, bomb the entire country, roll these armored units in, take important cities, take the capital, bam, it's over. And that's not what ended up happening. ...by a ground offensive in four general directions. The northern offensive by the Russian troops deployed in Belarus towards the capital, Kyiv. Which was, of course, the most important one, because traditionally, in warfare, you know, if you lose your capital, it's probably over. Not all the time, but if Ukraine had lost Kyiv, that would have been terrible. The Eastern Offensive from Belgorod towards Kharkiv. The Donbass Southeastern Offensive from the territories controlled by pro-Russian separatists and Voronezh towards the Ukrainian-controlled territories of the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblasts. And the Southern Offensive from Crimea towards Kherson, Mykolaiv and ultimately Odessa. It looks like the Russian strategy was to rapidly advance towards major urban centers, yep. taking large cities like Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Odessa as soon as possible to break the morale and resolve of the Ukrainians and force the government to capitulate, along with ensuring the land connection between the separatist-ruled part of Donbass and Crimea and securing the whole Black Sea shore of Ukraine. These four offensive axes were supposed to merge after securing advances along the front line to make pincer and envelopment movements more possible. The exact political endgame of the Russian offensive still puzzles analysts, with claims ranging from installing a pro-Russian puppet government to dividing eastern Ukraine into several pro-Russian states. Yeah, I think this is still a big question of what exactly Russia was and is going for. You know, some people say they wanted to annex all of Ukraine and govern it. Some people say they wanted to install a pro-Russian regime. Of course, there were these sort of initial demands about bringing NATO back. So, you know, it's unclear exactly what Russia wanted to do. I mean, what is clear is that they wanted to reestablish their sphere of influence in the region. But whether that meant annexing just eastern Ukraine, taking the whole country... Um, just kicking NATO out of Eastern Europe, whatever that meant, it was and sort of still is unclear. But, I mean, part of the reason it's unclear is because Russia never managed to achieve those goals. Thank God, right? Um, so yeah, it's still a little iffy what they were going for. Um, and with how, you know, the Russian economy has been destroyed since the war started and the war efforts going badly for them, you know, they're not... They haven't really gotten close to any of their goals, so, you know, I'm sure the government's goals have changed over time. At this point, I don't know what their goals would be. Just survive? Try to hold some positions in Ukraine? I don't know. The Ukrainian defense strategy was an orderly withdrawal to urban centers while fighting advancing Russian forces, bogging them down in urban warfare ambushing and attacking their supply lines. Mm. It would be illogical for the Ukrainian army to defend all the terrain along the whole of the massive front, given the Russian advantage in firepower. The analyst Michael Kaufman calls this tactic trading space for time. Yep. And, I mean, this is a tactic that Russia has used many times over. <laughs> you know, Russia is a gigantic country. If we look at, say, Napoleon's invasion of Russia... What did the Russian forces do? Well, they kept retreating, giving Napoleon more and more territory, but giving themselves more time and allowing Napoleon to stretch his supply lines out further and further. So this is a strategy that Russia is very familiar with. But in this case, Ukraine is using it because, to be fair, Ukraine, you know, it's not nearly as big as Russia, but it is still a very large country. So they have the space to sort of use that strategy. 
Um, though to be clear, you know, at the beginning of the war, it, with Russia using this sort of blitzkrieg, blitzkrieg-like strategy, it did kind of seem like it was going to work initially with them coming in from every direction. So it's remarkable that Ukraine even managed to resist that in the first place. On the first day of the invasion, Russia made the most significant advance on the southern front, where the 58th Combined Arms Army (CAA) advanced for about 60 kilometers, pushing the Ukrainian 57th Motorized Brigade back and taking the North Crimean Canal and reaching the outskirts of Kherson. Mm -hmm. On the northern front, the 35th CAA took Chernobyl and the Chernobyl power plant, while the yeah, I remember there was a lot of talk about <laughs> this, you know, being in, uh, you know, Chernobyl, this area, and, you know, there was a lot of chatter about other nuclear power plants and the risk of fighting around them and, you know, etc., etc. Turns out when you invade another country, <laughs> there's a lot of civilian infrastructure and it can be quite dangerous to, you know, perpetrate a war alongside civilian infrastructure like nuclear power plants. The 36th CAA pushed towards the capital Kyiv, bypassing Chernihiv. The Ukrainian 1st Tank Brigade managed to halt the Russian advance as it failed to capture the city of Chernihiv. The 41st CAA's advance towards Kyiv from Sumy was also halted in the outskirts of Sumy by the 56th Motorized Brigade. The Russian airborne attack on the Hostomel airport near Kyiv by the elite 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade of the Russian VDV elite airborne army, also failed after a Ukrainian counterattack. The rapid capture of Kharkiv did not happen either, as the 1st Guards tank army could not break the resistance of the Ukrainian 92nd Mechanized Brigade. The advance of the Luhansk militia and the Russian 20th CAA towards Severodonetsk met the resistance of the Ukrainian 53rd Brigade, with heavy fighting around the town of Shtestia. Hmm. Elements of the 8th CAA and the Donetsk militia pushed the 54th Mechanized Brigade towards the northwest from the Ukrainian DNR line of contact and the 56th Motorized Brigade towards the east along the Black Sea shore. I mean, we're seeing a lot of points like Mariupol that will become really important centers of conflict, will be fought over for a long time in the months to come. Some of these places will go back and forth. Some of the territory we've seen has just recently been reconquered by Ukraine. But I don't really want to talk about all of that because we're going to get to all of that down the line. With heavy fighting around Mariupol, but failed to reach its overall goals of taking over the rest of Donetsk Oblast and breaking the Ukrainian resistance. Mm. On the 25th of February, heavy fighting on all fronts continued. The Russian troops forced their way into Oblon, a mere nine kilometers away from the Ukrainian parliament building. Yeah. The 95th Air Assault Brigade and the 72nd Mechanized Brigade were there to protect Kyiv. At this point, the United States even offered Ukrainian President Zelensky a chance to leave the capital, to mm -hmm. which he reportedly replied, the fight is here, I need ammunition, not a ride. <laughs> Now look, you don't want to you don't want to make this some sort of cinematic Marvel movie type epic moment. Like this is serious. This is a war. But let's be honest, that's a pretty cool quote. <laughs> I mean, you can't deny that. You know, that that is Zelensky standing up for his country, for himself. He's saying, "I'm not running, you know. We're going to stand and fight." And so, I need you to help me. Um, and as you can see, looking at the map right now, look how close it got. That's what I'm saying. In these early hours, days of the war, it got incredibly close. But once Ukraine managed to stall Russia's advance and sort of hold them in place, in retrospect, we can see it was kind of already over for Russia, you know? But at the time, <laughs> that was not at all clear. It looked like it really could be over for Ukraine. Kyiv could be taken. The threat to the capital was real as yeah. during his speech to the nation, he called for the Ukrainians to brace for an offensive and urged them to prepare for a hard battle for Kyiv. Hmm. Yeah, and a word on the leadership of Zelensky. I mean, he was a comedian who was kind of unexpectedly elected to his position. And before this war, I think he was sort of a mediocre leader. You know, he wasn't great. But since the war started, he's proven that he is the man for the job. He can stand up for Ukraine. Uh, he can stand up to Russia. 
and he's been a pretty damn impressive leader this whole time. Zelensky's refusal to leave and insistence to fight against the odds turned him into a hero and the symbol of the Ukrainian resistance, further yeah. mobilizing Ukrainian society and galvanizing the international community to adopt crippling sanctions on Russia, such as disconnecting several major Russian banks from SWIFT. But the situation- Yeah, I mean, the Russian economy has really been completely crippled. Russian banks disconnected, uh, foreign businesses leaving Russia, they've really been incredibly cut off from, you know, the global economic order. And I do think that Zelensky's leadership, you know, him staying behind, all of that, that really inspired resistance amongst the people and a big part of Ukraine surviving and, you know, I don't know if you'd say winning, but pushing back uh, until this present moment has been the resistance of the people. The situation continued to be difficult for the Ukrainians. American intelligence predicted that the fall of Kyiv would happen mm -hmm. within 96 hours. Yeah. Even though the Russians failed to capture Sumy, they continued their march towards Kyiv from there, advancing to Romney. On the southern front, the Russians developed their success by capturing Novokohovka and moving closer to securing Kherson at Melitopol. Taking Melitopol was essential to continue the march along the Black Sea shore to merge with Russian and separatist units trying to take Mariupol along with advancing towards Zaporizhia, which could have encircled the Ukrainian units fighting on the Donbass front. Yeah. In Kharkiv and Donbass, the situation remained more or less stable, and there were even reports of Ukrainian counter-offensives pushing back the Russian units to the border in Milova. February 25th was also the day when the defenders of Zminyi Island, south of Odessa, famously responded to a Russian demand of mm -hmm. surrender. Fuck off, Russian military <laughs> ship. On February 26th, the Russian army mostly used special forces and airborne troops to fight the Ukrainian defense in Kyiv. With the 36th CAA giving up on the rapid capture of Chernihiv and bypassing it to move towards the capital, it looked like other Russian units around Kyiv were waiting for its arrival to strike Kyiv with massive force. Similarly unable to take the city of Kharkiv with a direct assault, the First Guards tank army divided into two groups to bypass the city, to possibly envelop the Ukrainian units in the city, or move towards Kyiv. I and mean, we can really see Russia's strategy in play with all of these decisions, where Russia is bypassing smaller towns or Ukrainian forces in order to conquer these big cities. And as we talked about at the beginning of this video, you know, that was one of their main points of strategy. That's what they really wanted to do. And I mean, to be Fair, it was pretty clear from the outset that's what they were doing with this assault from every side, closing in on cities like Kharkiv and Kyiv. You know, it was clear that that was their goal. And as they pointed out as well, it seemed like at the beginning they were going to succeed. The situation in the southeastern Donbass front remained relatively stable as well. The Russian troops and separatist militia captured the port of Berdyansk and the Berdyansk airport. DPR separatists also claimed to capture Pavlopol and Pistovik, while LNR separatists also claimed to seize Lopaskina and Makivka. Russia continued its advance on the southern front. The 42nd Guards Motor Rifle Division of the 58th CAA of the Russian Army continued fighting in Kherson, while also sending units towards the city of Mykolaiv. Other elements of the 58th CAA were engaged in fighting to seize Melitopol, along with advancing towards Enerhodar and the Zaporizhian power plant in the north. Mm -hmm. Oleksiy Aristovich, the advisor to the Ukrainian president, admitted on February 27th that Ukraine lost control of the whole of Berdyansk. Prevailing in Kherson and Melitopol, capturing Henichesk and Kherson airport, meant that the Russian offensive on the southern front developed its success, increasing the threat on Mykolaiv and Odessa in the west and Mariupol in the east. Yeah. The first reports of the Russian army merging its offensives in the southern and southeastern front around Mariupol also emerged on that day. But the continuing assault on Zaporizhia, namely on Anehada, Vasilivka and Tokmak, meant that the 58th CAA, the most successful unit of the Russian war effort so far, had to fight in three different directions, dividing its resources. On other fronts, the situation remained more or less stable, 
as Russia made small gains, such as the capture of Kupiansk and the encirclement of Konotov. But the 41st CAA's attack on Priluki and the 1st Guard's tank army's attacks on Kharkiv and Oktyrka were repelled. By now, it had become clear that the strategy of causing collapse of the Ukrainian defense by rapid mass offensive on major Ukrainian cities had failed, as the Ukrainian army not only remained functional in the cities, but also managed to harass Russian supply lines and inflict. Yup, and this is a point I was going to make. If you look at the map, you can kind of already see one of the big problems that Russia has had to deal with throughout this war is that they have these extended supply lines. And part of that is them ignoring Ukrainian forces or small towns and going for big cities. Now, that's great if your strategy succeeds, you conquer all the big cities and Ukraine surrenders. But if you don't and you have to fight a war that goes on for months and months and months, well, your supply lines are pretty exposed and... You know, and this is exactly what happened. They were harassed and attacked by Ukrainian forces, and that's been a major, major issue for Russia. Flicked major losses on the Russian manpower and military vehicles. In response to the Western sanctions and failure to rapidly defeat the Ukrainian resistance, Putin ordered Russia's nuclear forces on high alert. Yep, and this is another strategy Putin's been using throughout this conflict, is doing stuff like putting nuclear forces on high alert, subtly or sometimes not so subtly threatening the use of nukes you know we will defend ourselves we will defend our territorial integrity you know hinting at you know we'll use nukes if we have to this has been a scare tactic he's tried to use that has not worked at all you know the point of this is it's less directed at ukraine because they're clearly not going to stop fighting it's directed at the rest of the world he wants to prevent other countries from lending assistance to Ukraine and putting sanctions on Russia at the risk of nuclear war. Um, but his threats haven't worked so far. Uh, they have not been heeded by the countries of the world. Um, and, you know, he hasn't resorted to anything like that at this point. I mean, God forbid. Uh, he'd have to be a real madman to actually use nuclear weapons, but I think he's shown that he's... Um, capable of doing far more than we initially thought, or he's willing to do far more than we initially thought. So, I don't know. The valiant defense of Ukraine caught the West by surprise, as yeah. contrary to almost unanimous expectation of the fall of Ukraine, the Ukrainian army remained a force capable of defending the country. You know, Russia really has a habit of getting stuck in these wars against much smaller powers who end up putting up an impressive defense Went to war in Finland, Afghanistan, Ukraine. <laughs> As a result, for the first time in history, the EU announced direct military aid to a foreign country, yeah. Ukraine, while Germany made a major turn in its foreign policy by sending weapons to Ukraine and stating its intention to dramatically increase its military spending. Yeah, Germany usually doesn't do stuff like this. Um, and, I mean, you'll know why if you look back at German history. But Germany definitely stepped it up when this conflict began. And particularly at the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this was something that really brought the EU together. You know, the EU has sort of struggled with being a little fractured, uh, well, since its inception, but particularly over the last couple of years. But this war really brought the countries of the European Union together with a purpose. Now, as the war has dragged on, there's been a lot of pain in Europe due to uh, the oil, you know? And, and this is what Russia has over Europe, is that Russia provides them with a lot of natural gas. And a lot of that is now being withheld, or Europe is refusing to take it. And so now there's been a lot of trouble in Europe with, um, you know, economic troubles, affording gas prices, all that kind of stuff. But particularly at the beginning, you know, this did bring the EU really together in a way it hasn't been unified in a while. But Russia still possessed major resources sufficient to defeat Ukraine. On February 28th, satellite images of a 64 kilometer long massive column of tanks, military vehicles and artillery moving from Belarus yep. towards the western part of Kyiv were shared on social media. Along with that, on the Kyiv front, Elements of the 41st and 36th CAAs move to by For those of you wondering where does Belarus come into this, Belarus, like Russia, is ruled by an authoritarian Lukashenko. 
and they're one of Russia's few allies uh, throughout Europe. Um, they kind of have an interesting <laughs> uh, frenemy relationship. They are allies, but, you know, Russia does put a lot of pressure on Belarus at times. So that's why Belarus is involved on Russia's side. Um, they're basically alienated, uh, like Russia at this point, from the rest of Europe. Past Sumy and Chernihiv to merge with an aim to make a push towards East Kiev. Presumably, the overall goal was to attack Kiev from a number of directions. Yeah. But the maintenance of a formidable force by Ukraine in Chernihiv and Sumy Oblasts caused a major threat to the extended supply lines of the mm -hmm. Russian army. Elements of the Ukrainian 1st Tank Army conducted defensive actions against the 41st and 36th CAAs, stalling the Russian advance in Nizhin. Along with maintaining a solid defense around Kyiv, the Ukrainian forces also engaged in pointed counterattacks, such as in Makariv and Borodyanka. In Donbass, heavy battles around Volnovaka, Starobilsk and Mariupol continued. In Kharkiv, Ukraine set a defensive line between Chuhuiv and Balaklia, preventing the Russians from encircling Kharkiv and moving towards Poltava and Dnipro. Numerous reports of heavy shelling of civilian areas in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Mariupol and other cities of Ukraine continued. Also, the first death of a Russian general in the war was reported, as the deputy commander of the 41st CAA, Major General Andrei Sukhovetsky, was allegedly killed. On a diplomatic front, as expected, the first mm -hmm. round of Russian-Ukrainian negotiations in Belarus did not bring any positive results. No. Well, of course not, because Russia had the upper hand at this point. You know, even though there was Ukrainian resistance and pushback, I feel like they probably still thought they could achieve their goals and win this war. And in addition, you know, I don't think Ukraine was really interested in accepting any of the terms that Russia put forward, um, because, you know, they were uh, ridiculous. <laughs> they were the terms that they began the war with, um, and they were, weren't accepted in the first place, so they're not going to be accepted now. The first day of March brought several setbacks to the Ukrainian defense. Reports of capture of Kherson and Melitopol meant that now the 42nd Motor Rifle Division was free to move towards Mykolaiv, mm. while other units of the 58th CAA engaged in Melitopol could join the attack on Mariupol from the west, making the encirclement of the city a real threat. Yep. Reports of the Belarusian army joining the Russian offensive were not confirmed. On March 2nd, Western intelligence sources reported that Russia was switching its military tactic from head-on offensive on cities to attritional war, wearing down the Ukrainian army by continued assault on its defensive lines and shelling of Ukrainian cities to break the morale of the population, as the overall pace of their offensive remained well below expectations. Ukrainians report the reclaiming of Halivka by the forces of the 96th Air Assault Brigade and Makariv by the defenders of the Kyiv perimeter. During the next few days, both sides claimed to take Irpin, Butcher and Hostomel, towns in the vicinity of Kyiv, mm. the capture of which was crucial for the success of the Russian campaign in Kyiv. It indicates that heavy fighting was going on around this area, but these reports also stipulated that the Russian attacks were mostly carried out by one or two BTGs at the same time, which was interpreted... And of course, we're going to see a high number of civilian deaths from Russian assaults and, and Russian bombing in particular. And we're going to see atrocities in areas like Bucha. That was one of the most uh, famous sites. Um, but I suspect we'll cover those in future episodes. ...did by military experts as an inability for the Russian army to carry out coordinated attacks by a large number of units. Another point of the Russian offensive in the Kyiv front was Bravari, but the attempts to push back the Ukrainian army there by the 41st and 36th CAAs were repelled. Within the next several days, these unsuccessful attacks would continue. On other fronts, Russia took Balaklia, repelled the Ukrainian counterattack on Holivka, and engaged in heavy battle to take the Mykolaiv airport on March 3rd. Mm. But possibly the biggest gain of the Russian army on this day was the capture of Svatove, which is situated between Kharkiv and Luhansk by the 6th CAA and by the Luhansk militia. This allowed the Russian eastern and southeastern axes to link. 
The only positive result of the second round of negotiations was the agreement to open corridors for civilians stuck in encircled cities like Sumy, Chernihiv, and Mariupol. Yeah, and Russia recently pulled out of that agreement and then rejoined, I believe. Um, so, you know, there's an interesting sort of development. And I think really the southern and eastern fronts were, was where Russia had the most success for the longest. Though, of course, the northern front against Kyiv was the most threatening to Ukraine because, you know, Kyiv was the most important site. Uh, if that city was captured, then that would just be a massive blow to the Ukrainian defense. So that was sort of priority number one. But as you can see, Russia holds a lot of territory in southern and eastern Ukraine at this point. And they did for a while, and they still do hold a lot of territory, but they have been significantly pushed back in you know recent weeks, recent months. On the 4th to 6th of March, Russia made important gains on several fronts. In the south, the 58th CAA took an Ehadar and the power plant in the vicinity, along with Tokmak and Vasilivka. There were also reports of successful Russian advances on the Mykolaiv airport and heavy fighting in the Mykolaiv Oblast, mm. which was defended by the 57th Motorized Brigade. Along with that, the 6th CAA and Luhansk separatist forces started attacking Izium and Severodonetsk. The fall of these cities could have been disastrous for Ukraine, as it could have possibly allowed the Russian units to encircle the 56th Motorized Brigade and other Ukrainian units fighting in Donbass. Heavy fighting was reported along the chuhuiv balaklia line, which the Ukrainian defense managed to withstand. They were not as successful at the nezhin Priluki line, as the Russians were able to penetrate it, pushing within 20 kilometers of central Kyiv from the northeast. And you can see why Kyiv was priority number one. I mean, one, as I mentioned, its importance, but two, you know, it is currently, or by currently, I mean at the moment we're seeing on the map, being surrounded by Russian forces, uh, it was really not looking great. I mean, today, of course, the situation is much different, but at a time, it really looked like Kyiv might be totally captured by the Russians. I mean, they had that very threatening northern front. And they were pushing in from the east. There was relentless bombing. You know, at times, it really was not looking good. The Russians also managed to encircle Oktyrka, on March 7th, Ukraine managed to reclaim the Mykolaiv airport and Chuhuiv. The massive tank column in the west of Kyiv still threatened the city, but no significant fighting or movement in that direction was reported. This was also the day when the first international volunteers joined the defense of Kyiv. Mm. In the south, Russia repeated its tactic of bypassing the cities, which it failed to take with a head-on assault, as the 7th Guards Mountain Air Assault Division bypassed Mykolaiv towards Vosnesensk. The aim was to force the southern Burg River and advance on strategically crucial Odessa. On March 8th, Russia took steps to solidify its encirclement of Mariupol by capturing the highway between the city and Volnovaka, while also moving elements of the 41st CAA to the Sumy Oblast to strengthen its extended and constantly attacked supply lines. On the 9th to the 12th, the Ukrainian 1st Tank Division managed to repel the Russian offensive by the 90th Tank Division and the 55th Motorized Rifle Brigade on Chernihiv, along with establishing a connection with the pocket of resistance in Nizhyn. Mm. Heavy battles continued in Izium and Severodonetsk. Russian offensives on Bravari by the 6th Guards Tank Regiment, on Godyach by the 4th Guards Tank Division, and on Krovoyuri by the 7th Guards Mountain Air Assault Division were also successfully repelled. But the Ukrainian situation around Mariupol continued to deteriorate as the Russian forces... Like I said, Mariupol was sort of an early center of conflict between the two sides. It was a hot spot, one of the ones that you would keep seeing popping up in the news. Um, and apologies for some of the lack on, uh, of commentary on this, but, you know, we're going through the war day by day. Um, so I only have commentary on some of the bigger events that occurred. And Donetsk separatists moved into portions of the eastern part of the city, along with taking Volnovaka. The infamous tank column northwest of Kyiv by now had dispersed and redeployed elsewhere. 
The most important event of the 13th to 16th of March was the ballistic strike at the Yavoriv training center near Lviv, mm. as the Russian defense ministry claimed that 180 mercenaries were killed in this strike on the base, where training of foreign volunteers was conducted. By these dates, it had become quite clear that Russia had stalled in all directions and was unable to conduct any major offensive operations anywhere but Donbass. Yep. While the Russians made some gains in Izium and pushed around Rabizhne, the Ukrainian offensive towards Kherson pushed the 20th Guards Motor Rifle Division and reached the town of Posad Pokrovska. The Ukrainians also broke the encirclement of Okhtyrka. On the 19th to 20th of March, reports of Russian troops digging trenches and deploying minefields around Kyiv indicate that the Russians had given up on offensive operations to take the capital. Yeah, and we can really see watching this video in real time how the offensive stalled in this sort of blitzkrieg-like strategy. You really do have to sweep in and take everything at once. That was the goal, and Russia certainly did sweep in, and they took a lot of territory, they took a lot of important points, but they failed to meet all of their goals, and they failed to take Kyiv, the most important city in Ukraine. And since they couldn't manage to do that, you basically have to shift gears, and that's what they did, start to dig in, go for more of a war of attrition, uh, and that's why, you know, over the last couple of days of what we've been seeing in this video, a lot of those sweeping territorial shifts have sort of slowed down, and we're getting a little more back and forth between the two sides. And prepared for a defensive war. On March 21st to 24th, Ukraine gained ground around Kyiv by counterattacking towards Bucha, Vozol, Moschen, Makariv, and Irpin, while Russia made progress in Izium and Mariupol. On the 25th to 29th of March, Ukraine capitalized on the low morale and poor supply of the Russian army and made considerable progress on several fronts. Yeah, you know, highlight on the low morale of the Russian army. When the war began, I remember there was some reporting that a lot of the Russian troops sent to Ukraine didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, I'm sure they had some idea, some vague idea, but they were not informed of the details of the assignment. Plus, as we've seen since, you know, the morale of the Russian population is fairly low. A lot of people don't necessarily agree or believe in this war, or at least believe in it enough to put their lives on the line. That, combined with a lack of training, a lack of supplies, and, you know, soon, a lack of victories against Ukraine has meant that the morale of the Russians has been very low, whereas the morale of the Ukrainians has stayed quite high. I mean, they've been really resilient, you know, willing to hold out against all odds. And, of course, we can look at numbers, numbers of troops, numbers of tanks, weapons... And a lot of Ukraine's success is definitely due to all the weapons they've been given by the West. But that morale is also a key factor. The Ukrainian army solidified its successes on the key front by pushing back the 37th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade and the 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade from Irpin and the 90th Tank Division further away from Bravari and reclaimed Lukyanivka. In the sumy kharkiv axis, the 93rd Brigade took back Trostyanets, Boromlia, and Malarohan, and ended the encirclement of the city of Sumy, forcing the 27th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade to withdraw to Russia for presumed redeployment in Donbass, mm. where Russia still had a capability to launch a successful offensive operation and made some gains around Izium and Severodonetsk. Yeah, I mean, Donbass particularly with the events prior to the war, the fact that there was already a separatist movement and Russia already had some control over the region. Donbass has really been one of the most stable regions Russia has held. Though, like I said, in recent times, we've seen Ukraine pushing them back even there, you know, which is why it's so notable, but this has been the most secure region for Russia. Um, you know, the area they've held in the south is also... Uh, they've held on to for a while, even though, like I said, now Ukraine's pushing back sort of in all directions. Along with capturing more of Mariupol, putting the Ukrainian defense of the city in an even more desperate situation. Yep. On the southern front, the Russian offensive had completely stalled as well. On the 30th of March, 
reports of withdrawal of several Russian units from the Kyiv axis started to emerge, whether due to heavy losses or as part of a campaign to de-escalate military operations around Kyiv. Along with that, read Though of course, the whole time the Russian government <laughs> basically refused to admit that anything was going wrong, that they were withdrawing, you know, they were saying, you know, our goals are the same as they've always been, so... You know, the Russian government refused to admit to the world and, of course, to their own people because um, it's an authoritarian government. There's no sort of uh, free press. There's very limited press. Uh, and so, you know, the government wanted to make it seem like everything was going to plan, but everything has not been going to plan for the Russian forces. Deployment of Russian units, such as the elements of the 30th CAA and the 1st Guards Tank Army to Belgorod for replenishment, to presumably later send them to the Donbass front continued. During the next couple of days, we witnessed several instances of fighting on the northern front with Ukrainian success, and then a complete withdrawal of Russian units from Kyiv and Chernihiv Oblasts. The 35th, 36th and 41st CAAs made an orderly withdrawal towards Belarus, while reports of the redeployment of the 90th Tank Division and 2nd Guards Motor Rifle Division to the Donbass front emerged. On April 2nd, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry stated that Ukraine was now controlling all of the Kyiv Oblast. Mm. On April 4th, the governor of Zhytomyr Oblast also stated that the region was now completely under Ukrainian control. By April 5th, there were no Russian troops left in the Chernihiv Oblast either. Ukraine prevailed on the Northern Front and the Battle of Kyiv against all odds. Yeah, it really was against all odds and that's point I've been making throughout this video, they pushed Russia back north, and they've been pushing Russia back everywhere, but Russia held on the most in southern and eastern Ukraine. Uh, and that's what we're going to see over these videos, you know, the next couple months of the conflict. That's where a lot of the fighting has been. But Russian loss came at a very high price for the Ukrainian military, infrastructure, mm. and particularly the civilian population. Yeah. As the Ukrainian army reclaimed Bucha, it witnessed horrific scenes of hundreds of civilians lying dead on its streets. Yeah, and these were the atrocities I was talking about earlier. Just horrible, horrible massacres. Um, it, it, Bucha is the best example, but of course there have been atrocities uh, throughout the conflict. Satellite images taken on the days when the Russian army still controlled this town prove beyond reasonable doubt that this massacre was indeed committed by Russia. Ukraine also staged counterattacks in Zaporizhia and Kherson Oblasts. On the 31st of March, they liberated Malinivka, Vesela, Zelenyihai, and other towns in the Zaporizhia Oblast, along with several towns and settlements in the Kherson Oblast, including Novovorontsovka on the 1st to 2nd of April. But around the same dates, Russia continued very slow but steady progress in Donbass, mm -hmm. as they claimed to capture Zolota Niva in the Donetsk Oblast and Zhitlivka in the Luhansk Oblast. On the 1st of April, Ukraine admitted that Russia was able to capture Izium after days of heavy fighting. But arguably, the most important event of this day was the Ukrainian strike on a fuel storage depot in the Russian city of Belgorod which was the first incident of spillover of the war in Ukraine to Russian territory. Yeah, and that was a remarkable moment because the whole war had been fought on Ukraine's territory. And at times, Russia had pushed really far into Ukraine. It had been bombing all of Ukraine's cities, a lot of bombing against civilian populations. And so this was the first time that there had been action on Russian territory. On April 4th, Reports of the advance of the Russian forces from the Kharkiv axis towards Slavyansk started emerging. According to various military experts, the capture of Slavyansk created options to link up with the Russian units fighting in Rubizhna or advancing towards Holivka, both of which carried a potential risk of encirclement for the Ukrainian units on the Donbass front. By the 5th of April, elements of the 1st Guards Tank Army, including elements of the 2nd GMRD, 4th GTD, 47th GTD, the 106th GAD, the 144th MRD, and the 3rd MRD were redeployed to Izium, and we can expect most of the Russian offensive operations to be conducted along the Donetsk River. 
which the Ukrainian 25th... <laughs> well, of course, they couldn't see the future. This video was made months ago. But yes, they were correct. <laughs> Since this point, um, you know, it's November now, right? We're talking about the beginning of April the primary location of military operations has been southern eastern Ukraine, the Donbass in particular. In fact, Russia's sort of done a bit of a shift of its military goals, um, and the government claims that, well, our goal was always to secure uh, the Donbass, you know, Donetsk, Luhansk, even though, of course, their goal was initially <laughs> to conquer Kiev, the capital, uh, and, you know, have the Ukrainian government surrender. But so they've sort of shifted very much to the Donbass. And that has been where a lot of the fighting has been focused since this point, since the initial Russian sort of encirclement of Kiev and the entire country was pushed back. Airborne Brigade and the 81st Air Assault Brigade will try to defend. The presidential aide, Arestovich, noted in his interview that the Ukrainian army faces 8 to 1 numerical disadvantage on this axis. On the 6th of April, it was confirmed that the Russian army completed its withdrawal from the Sumy Oblast too. These forces were to be redeployed in Donbass too. Lastly, the situation of the Ukrainian units in Mariupol was getting increasingly more desperate. Yeah. According to British intelligence, by April 7th, Russia already controlled 76% of the city. Like I said, this was something you would see continuously popping up in the news. You know, updates on Mariupol. It's increasingly getting more and more desperate for the Ukrainians. But it is also reported that the Russian units participating in the siege of Mariupol are suffering heavy losses amid fierce resistance by the Azov Battalion and units of the regular Ukrainian army. In the run-up to and on the first few days of the war, Almost everyone expected a quick Russian victory and mm. the collapse of the Ukrainian army. Yep. It was only a question of when. But the Ukrainian army has defied the odds by standing tall and, more recently, prevailing in the Battle of Kyiv and reclaiming some of the lost territories in other regions. Despite the overwhelming advantage in firepower, bad planning by the Russian command manifested in an inability to conduct major offensive operations in the coordination of a large number of units and different branches of the military. This is very true, and if we look at this map, yeah, sure, it's not great to have that much of your territory taken by another country, but if you compare it to the beginning of the war, that's an incredible victory for Ukraine, and if you keep in mind that, you know, by now, November, Ukraine has taken back a lot of that territory you see that's in Russian hands at the beginning of April. It really is remarkable that not only did Ukraine manage to survive, resist the initial Russian attack, being so outmanned, outgunned, but they've managed to push back and have won a lot of victories at this point. It really is incredible. Um, I mean, it shows you, it shows you a lot of things. Like they're saying how disorganized the Russians were, how much they lacked on supplies, how low their morale is. It shows you the resistance of the Ukrainians, you know, their comparative organization and high morale. It shows you the effectiveness of the supplies and weapons that they've been given by powers from around the world. Uh, it shows you how much damage has been done to the Russian economy and the Russian government by the sanctions and actions taken against them by countries around the world. So can really learn a lot uh, from how this has turned out. Poor logistical preparation was demonstrated by images of incapacitated military vehicles yep. due to lack of fuel and insufficient food supplies proved by the Russian looting of civilian stores. Low morale, the clear indicator of which is scores of Russian servicemen, mm -hmm. particularly conscripts, surrendering to Ukrainians, since they don't really understand what they're fighting for and are just completely unprepared for the brutality of war. In yeah, and of course we've seen ever since Putin uh, started like partial conscription, there have been a massive amount of Russians fleeing the country. And that's the point I made earlier. There definitely are supporters of the war in Russia, I'm not denying that, but there are a lot of people who either don't support the war, or <laughs> at least don't support it enough to go and die for it. 
which is good because that means they're not willing to go and fight. Uh, and a lot of the conscripts sent really weren't willing to go and fight either. Um, so that has definitely been proven since this video was released. Inability to ensure air domination, despite the huge numerical advantage in military yeah. aircraft, has made the Russian war effort in Ukraine go horribly wrong. Around Kharkiv and the south of Ukraine, the Russians have been pushed back as well. The only axis where Russians and pro-Russian separatists can hope to gain any considerable success is the southeastern front. The Russian general staff has stated in late March that its main focus is on the so-called liberation of Ukrainian-controlled territories of Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts, since it remains the only front where the Russians can realistically hope for success. And that's what I was saying earlier, um, you know, the high command and the Russian government saying, well, that's our goal, and pretending like that was always their goal, even though, like I said, clearly their initial goal was to conquer Kyiv. Russia continues to employ the tactic of shelling cities, mm. including civilian areas, causing the death of 1,611 civilians, according to the UN. Mm. Mariupol, Kharkiv, Sumy and other cities have been heavily damaged. Millions of Ukrainians have fled their country. Both sides have suffered heavy losses, but the Ukrainians have inflicted way more damage on the Russians than was expected. By April 7th, Oryk's military analysis blog visually confirmed Russian losses at 448 destroyed or abandoned tanks. Obviously, once again, take these numbers with a grain of salt. I'm sure we have, <laughs> one, updated numbers for the first couple of months of the war at this point. And of course, you know, we fought months of the war since this. So, you know, we have updated numbers for the whole conflict. 750 armored vehicles, 20 fighter jets, 32 helicopters, and three Navy ships, against Ukrainian losses of 95 tanks, under 200 armored vehicles, 18 aircraft and helicopters, and 15 ships. According to the NATO estimates of the 29th of March, seven to 15,000 Russian soldiers have Jesus. been killed in Ukraine. The US sources reported on the 9th of March that two to 4,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed during the invasion. And, you know, these numbers have certainly increased a lot since this point, which is a true tragedy. I mean, it's really a tragedy to see people dying on both sides, right? Clearly, um, I, Russia is the aggressor and the bad guy in this situation. But, you know, every person, every soldier, uh, uh, no love lost for any Russian, like, generals or whatever who died during this conflict, but... You know, any one of the conscripts, the common soldiers on both sides is a real tragedy when they die. And you can see at that point, even thousands, uh, you know, could be as much as 19,000 deaths. And I'm sure it's gotten a lot worse since then and a lot of civilian deaths, too. We must be talking about tens of thousands, if not, maybe we'll reach hundreds of thousands of deaths um, I don't quite know what the numbers are, but it's really, really unfortunate. Soon, we will summarize the second month of this conflict, which proved to be not the short, victorious war Vladimir Putin hoped for, but a war of attrition that could change the fate of the entire region. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. All right, and make sure to do the same for this video. I'd very much appreciate it if you would like, comment, and subscribe. So yeah, this was a good one. Like I said, this is a serious one because it's an ongoing conflict. We will continue to react to this series until we catch up to the present. Um, once again, apologies for my voice and cough and clear in my throat. It's just unavoidable. Uh, like I said, I'm a little sick right now, so there's not much I can do. But I'm trying to work through it and still make these videos for you guys. So yeah, I had a good time with this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, you know, if you did, please check out the Patreon and the channel memberships. I hope you guys are all having a good day today. And I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.